Thank you very much, uh, Foreign Secretary, for that very warm introduction. And I'm grateful to you and say, David, for the warm and supportive words you've said about my organization and myself. Listening to you and hearing this warm applause, I wonder why I spend so much time on the other side of the Atlantic. <laughs> Dear friends, first of all, let me thank you for this invitation and thank you all for being here and for holding this meeting in this place at this time. Last year, we celebrated the 60th anniversary of the Charter of the United Nations. And today, we celebrate UN's 60th birthday as a working organization. In this very hall, on 10 January 1946, as you've heard, the General Assembly met for the first time. On 17th of January, the church house just across the road, the Security Council came into being. On the 1st of February, Trigvili of Norway was elected, and on the following day, formally installed as the first Secretary General. Aha. Uh -huh. You had forgotten that bit, I'm sure. But don't worry. We Secretary Generals are used to being overlooked. <laughs> 60 years ago, when the American Ambassador rose in this hall to recommend the candidate chosen by the Security Council, he had to get Brian Eckhart to point trickfully out to him, and then proceeded immediately to mispronounce his name. The best thing about the story, of course, is that uh, Brian is still very much part of the UN family and still helping to point us in the right direction. <laughs> but what, you ask, was Brian doing there? And how had the Assembly and the Council managed to organize themselves without a Secretary General to tell them where to sit and how to vote. <laughs> the answer is that Brian was working for the acting Secretary General, who was a famous British diplomat, Gladwin Jebb. Right from the start, you see, the Brits had quietly put themselves in charge. <laughs> and, and so it has been ever since. You may have noticed that one of your compatriots has even infiltrated himself as my chef de cabinet. In the United Nations, one of Jack Straw's predecessors, one of Jack Straw's predecessors said, you punch above your weight. One such skillful pugilist is Lord Haney. He was kind enough to serve on my high-level panel for threats, challenges, and change, and made an enormously valuable contribution. David, I'm delighted you've taken on the chairmanship of UNA UK. You and Sam Dawes will make a dream team. I'm <laughs> you. <coughs> Uh, no, I, I, should not, I should not go there. <laughs> no. I'm very grateful to Sam, to Richard Jolly, and to the association as a whole for all they have done to publicize my larger freedom report and organize public consultations about it, just as I am grateful to Jack and his colleagues, including notably the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, for the wonderful support they have given. Thanks to your work, many people in this country have grasped the message of my report, who drew, as you heard earlier, on the high-level panels report and on the Millennium Project report, Investing in Development. Put that message is twofold. First, we are all in the same boat. 
More than ever before, the human race faces global problems, from poverty and inequality to nuclear proliferation, from climate change to bird flu, from terrorism to HIV AIDS, from ethnic cleansing and genocide to trafficking in human lives and bodies of human beings. So it, is, it obviously makes sense to come together and work out global solutions. And secondly, the three freedoms which all human beings crave, freedom from want, freedom from war or large-scale violence, and freedom from arbitrary and degrading treatment are closely interconnected. There is no long-term security without development, and there is no development without security. And no society can long remain secure or prosperous without respect for human rights and the rule of law. That is a premise on which the larger freedom agenda is based. And since you have taken such a keen interest, I believe I owe you a progress report. It was, as you know, agenda for the summit last September. So let me start by mentioning the areas where the summit took important steps forward. Obviously, I didn't get everything I had hoped for, but they did take some important steps forward. First, it helped to stimulate major new commitments of aid and debt relief, amounting to doubling of aid for Africa, and won a strong unanimous reaffirmation of the Millennium Development Goals. There especially, I must salute UK's leadership, both in the Group of Eight and in the European Union. The developing countries, too, gave very important commitments, starting with an undertaking to produce, by the end of the year, national strategies for reaching the development goals by 2015. In the area of humanitarian relief, the summit has given us much emergency fund which should enable us to respond promptly when disaster strikes. In the area of peace and security, member states agreed to strongly condemn terrorism in all its forms and manifestations committed by whomever, wherever, and for whatever purposes. And they instructed the General Assembly without delay to develop, adopt, and implement a comprehensive global terrorism strategy built on the elements I set out in Madrid last year. But their most concrete decision in this area was the creation of the Peace Building Commission. This body will fill a real institutional gap and ensure that attention and resources are devoted to countries emerging from violence long after the peacekeepers have left.